God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to our virtual worship services. We're thankful that you are here. It is the first Sunday in February. This is the first Sunday in February in which we celebrate um, the Lord's Supper. And also, brothers and sisters, we're celebrating Black History Month. We are thankful that you are here. We're just going to give you a moment or two uh, to come in uh, as we get started. We're going to give you a moment or two uh, to come in as you get started. Brothers and sisters, there's an old hymn uh, that uh, used to be sang uh, by uh, our African-American or, or our African ancestors, uh, and it was called Kumbaya, Kumbaya. And as we get started, uh, brothers and sisters, we want to sing Kumbaya, which means come by here, come by here. But before we do that, brothers and sisters, before we do that, before we do that, we're going to allow little Avery uh, to call us into worship with the reading of the scripture. We're going to allow little Avery to call us into worship with the reading of the scripture. Amen. At this time, Avery, go ahead and read. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord, for he laid its foundation on the sea and established it on the river. Thank you, Avery. Thank you. You have been called uh, into uh, worship. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says that out of babes, out of the mouth of babes uh, comes uh, worship and praise. And we thank God for Avery uh, and her helping us uh, to be called into worship. Now, if you would, uh, I know we don't have musicians present, but if you can use your spiritual uh, mind's ear of imagination, imagine uh, the chords being played along to this song. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. Somebody's praying, Lord, come by here. Somebody's praying, Lord, come by here. Somebody's praying, Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. Come on, help me sing. Somebody singing, Lord, come by here. Somebody singing, Lord, come by here. Somebody singing, Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, come by here. We want to pause for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for coming by here. Lord God, we Thank you for this awesome opportunity to celebrate uh, the heritage and the history of African-American uh, people. God, we thank you uh, for this day, this first Sunday, to remember uh, the blood that you shed and 
the broken body uh, that was bruised for the redemption of our sins. God, we pray now that something is said uh, during this worship opportunity that will change the trajectory of someone's life. Lord God, we pray for all of the virtual listeners and God, we pray for all of those who are in social media land. Lord God, that they can see the beacon of light uh, that is out, uh, that, that serves to uh, give us the direction to a savior who can save all. God, we thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for the pleasant parishioners and thank you for the partners of PG. God, we ask that you be present in this worship service today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, right before we jump into the word of God, we again celebrate Black History Month this month. And just for a moment, we're going to allow Zion to share with us uh, a small uh, nugget of Black History. Black History Month is an annual celebration that started in 1926 as Negro History Week by historian Carter G. Woodson. It was dedicated to mark a time to honor African Americans and raise awareness of black history. From there, it grew into a month of celebration and February was chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln, the U.S. president who issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and Frederick Douglass, an African-American orator, social reformer, writer, and uh, abolitionist. In 1976, Black History Month was officially recognized in the United States under President Gerald Ford. Today, we recognize Black History Month as both, both celebration and a powerful reminder of our culture to honor the struggles and accomplishments of our ancestors, and that Black history is American history. Thank you, thank you Zion, and thank you Avery for your participation in worship. All right, come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in. Pleasant parishioners, again, we are thankful for you joining us on this morning. Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles, if you will, turn in your Bibles, turn in your Bibles. It is time for the word of God, for the people of God. And let us all say amen. Come on, hit some emojis. Give me some thumbs up, some hearts, just to let us know that you are in the building and we are thankful for you. Amen, amen, amen. Let us jump into the word of God. We are going to the book of John going to the book of John. I also want to thank everyone uh, who uh, supported the uh, revival on Wednesday. I am thankful for your support. I saw you popping up on the live feed and I heard your encouragement. Thank you so much. We are thankful for you and we are thankful for all of those who uh, have birthdays uh, in this February month. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. It is coincidental uh, that we have two people at the church who shares the birthday on today. Uh, we want to wish a happy birthday uh, to uh, Reverend Mary Tillman and to Barry Taylor. God bless you again. We are thankful for you. Uh, we pray longevity to you and also a great quality of life. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday to all February babies. Amen. 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 If you would, again, go with me to John the ninth chapter. John the ninth chapter, and we'll be reading um, verses one through four. John 9, 1 through 4. John 9, 1 through 4. John 9, 1 through 4. And when you have it, say amen, give a thumbs up, give us a heart. 
Amen. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and my Bible reads thusly. And he was passing by. As he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responds like this, neither this man or his parents sinned. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of God who sent me. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And brothers and sisters, just for a moment or better, uh, we want to use as uh, a subject, uh, a message in your miracles. I want you to know that whatever you are going through, um, there is a message uh, in the miracle that brings you through. There is a message in God's miracles. Brothers and sisters, as we consider this particular gospel, we know that this gospel uh, is one of the gospels that are not synoptic, meaning it is not a seeing together. It is not similar uh, to the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But as we look at this particular gospel, we see that John highlights uh, the uh, divinity of Jesus Christ. There is a high soteriology uh, of, uh, there is a high divinity in the soteriology of Jesus Christ. As we look at this particular text, the miracles recorded in John's gospel, they account for Jesus' earthly ministry. And we see that Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, they are pregnant with the truths of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Again, John's focus was on the divinity of Jesus Christ. There is a message with every miracle that points to the divinity of Jesus Christ. For example, if you walk with me in the second chapter, Jesus turned water into wine. He turned water into wine at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. This miracle conveys the message that Jesus can take things that are ordinary and turn them into things that are delightful, extraordinary, and elegant. Brothers and sisters, again, I want you to know that Jesus has the miraculous power to take those things that are ordinary and transform them into things that are extraordinary. And I want you to understand that God can do that same thing in your life. God can take what you think is mediocre. He can take an average you, an average me, and turn us into something extraordinary. Similarly, Jesus' divinity is revealed in the miracle chronicled in chapter 4. This chapter introduces to us a thirsty woman whose life had been turned upside down. And you do know that can happen in life. Brothers and sisters, life has a way of turning our uh, situations upside down. Life has a way of turning us topsy-turvy. Life uh, turned her situation upside down. Her relationships with six different men had failed. So she was in desperate need of hope. And Jesus' dialogue with this woman at the well inspired her with new energy and zeal to live again. And I want to encourage someone in that God can do the same thing with you. You may think that you've messed up so badly that there is no going forward. 
But Jesus can return to you the zeal and the energy and the will to live again. Brothers and sisters, he turned her desert into an oasis, revealing his divine character as the water of life. If you all heard me last uh, on Wednesday, you know that Jesus proclaimed that he's not just one who offers water, but he is the water of life. Another aspect of Jesus' divine nature is recorded in chapter 11. This chapter explains how Jesus' friend Lazarus died. Jesus showed up and called him back from death and the grave. The following, uh, brothers and sisters, after we look at this particular miracle, we follow this miracle uh, and we see the following miracle. He declared that, brothers and sisters, uh, that he was the resurrection and the life. Again, brothers and sisters, what I would suggest to you that there is a message in this miracle. There is a message about Christ's divinity. And I don't want you to miss it because there is a message in every miracle that is documented in the Apostle John's gospel. What we uh, also need to know is that oftentimes in the biblical narratives, individual afflictions and physical ailments are signs of the spiritual condition of a nation or a community. For instance, in the Old Testament, the prophet, uh, the prophet Hosea's marriage to a prostitute symbolized Israel's going after other gods. Furthermore, Barren women were often indicative of Israel's lack of productiveness and their spiritual decay. And I want you all to look at the biblical scriptures and don't miss what God is saying. Look at John 9. The focus of this sermon supports this concept. Physical ailments, brothers and sisters, are signs of spiritual decay. And the miracles uh, that Jesus performed, brothers and sisters, were filled with truths about his divine nature. In the, ne in the text uh, before us, brothers and sisters, uh, we see that there is a physically blind man. This, my, this man was blind. He could not see. He was a product, although, of a spiritually blind community. He was physically blind, but one of the things that the author is trying to get the audience to see is that he was not only physically blind, but he was a product of a spiritually blind community that was in need of Jesus. He was part of a community, brothers and sisters, that were blind and in need of the light of the world. They were blind and they needed Jesus to open their eyes. Well, brothers and sisters, as I examine this passage and I examine what the apostle John wrote about this community, I realized that, that uh, I realized the African proverb that says that it takes a village to raise a child. As a matter of fact, that applies to this particular situation because if the village is blind spiritually, then the children will be blind. If the village is lost, then the children will be lost. And I want to remind you this, brothers and sisters, if the village fails to pray, then the children won't pray. If the village fails to be discipled, then the children won't be discipled. If the village misses the message of Jesus Christ in the helping our brothers and sisters and offering radical hospitality to others, then our children 
will use and take that same position, brothers and sisters, again, if the village is lost, if the village is blind, then the children will be lost and blind. There are a couple of things that I want to share with you that raises or emerges from this text. First of all, one of the things that I want to uh, remind all of us of is that we all have blind spots. Tell somebody that, brothers and sisters, that you may be interacting with. So tell somebody who's at home with you virtually. We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. I know that because what Jesus said in the text, Jesus said that when the blind leads the blind, all will fall into a ditch. It appears that everyone in this particular community where the blind man was born and raised suffered from some kind of blindness. If you all don't believe me, go with me through the text in verse uh, in verse one and two. Verse one, brothers and sisters, um, the man was born blind. In verse eight, we see that neighbors in the community were blind. We see in verses 20 through 22, there were parents who were blind. Brothers and sisters, if we look at verses 15 and 16, there were Pharisees who were blind. There were folks who were blind all over. And even though these folks were pillars in the community, what the text says is that they were blind. The truth is, brothers and sisters, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, all of us, no matter who you are, no matter how staunch of a believer you are, no matter how well dug into the scripture you are, all of us have some blind spots. All of us have some blind spots. Tell somebody, all of us have some blind spots. Brothers and sisters, I became acutely aware of blind spots not long ago. I was driving down I-70, brothers and sisters, and I went to change lanes, and I looked back. I didn't see anybody uh, in the back window, brothers and sisters. I looked in the rearview mirror. I didn't see anyone and brothers and sisters, I began to get over and all of a sudden there was someone frantically blowing their horn. Brothers and sisters, and if we had not swerved, we would have hit each other. Brothers and sisters, uh, and one thing that I failed to look at is the rear, the side view mirrors. One of the new technological advances about a side view mirror, brothers and sisters, is that now cars come with a light that comes on on the side view mirror to let one know that there is something in your blind spot. Although you can't see it, although you can't detect it, the light pops on and lets you know that there is something in your blind spot. All of us have blind spots, but thank God for that technological advancement when the light comes on and lets us know that there there's something that we don't see. There's something there that we can't detect. And I thank God for that light that pops on in our while we are on the roads of our spiritual lives. I thank God for that light that pops on when we are walking on our short sojourn with the Savior. As a matter of fact, the word of God says that God is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. Brothers and sisters, when there is something in our blind spot, the Holy Spirit illuminates our way so that we won't trip over traps that Satan has set in our path. But I want you to know that all of us have blind spots. All of us have blind spots in life. All of us from some time at some time or another suffer from blind spots. There are some things that brothers and sisters that we just can't see. Just as I couldn't see the vehicle behind me in the truck that I was driving brothers and sisters, but we want to explore 
what characterizes spiritually blind communities. If you all allow me just a moment to, we want to characterize uh, what causes spiritually blind communities. Brothers and sisters, here's a number one characteristic of a spiritually blind community. Number one, blind communities will always focus on symptoms instead of causes. I know you all are reminiscing about the sermon I preached Wednesday where I told you don't mistake uh, the anesthetic for the antidote. Now I want you to look at the symptoms. A blind community looks only at the symptoms and not the causes. If you don't believe me, walk with me and look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Turn in your Bibles to verse 8. Verse 8 will inform us that the community in which the blind man lived viewed him as a beggar. They viewed him as a beggar. However, begging was only a symptom and not the real cause of a man's blind. I wish I had a praying church in here today. In other words, brothers and sisters, again, I say it was a symptom and not the cause. His blindness, his begging was only a symptom of the real cause, which was the man's blindness. It is unfortunate, pleasant parishioners that in many of our communities, in many of our homes, and even in many of our churches, we only see and treat symptoms, but not the cause of problems. Now, I want to push on. I want to push on. I don't want to hold you too long today. But the second characteristic of spiritually blind communities or homes or even churches is this. Blind communities are filled with fault finders. I, I pray that we don't ever become uh, uh, the one that has this particular blind spot. But I want you to know that blind communities are filled with fault finders. For instance, if we look at verse two, let's slow down for a minute. Verse two, the apostle asked Jesus, says, master, who sinned? Who did sin? His parents or uh uh, the, uh, was it his parents? Was it this man or was it his parents that he was born blind? Brothers and sisters, if you all remember uh, our Bible study uh, the, the week before last, there were also uh, there was a community of fault finders. You all remember Job, don't you? Job was sick almost unto death. And his friends and his wife always found fault. They said it must have been something that you did. Brothers and sisters, in uh, one of the characteristics of the spiritually blind community, there are always fault finders. Uh, whether it was this man or his parents, someone was at fault. Likewise, brothers and sisters, this community complained or found fault with Jesus even healing the blind man on the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we can get so hung up on approach that we forget that somebody is being delivered. We can get so hung up on the traditional things that we forget that someone's life is being changed. Brothers and sisters, they looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, we don't do that around here. This is not our custom. We don't do stuff like that on the Sabbath. But brothers and sisters, we've got to be careful to look at what God is doing rather than finding fault in what's being done. We should not become so focused on the doom and the gloom and the way we did life that we fail to recognize the power of God in what he's doing in life. Do I have any witnesses in here? God is able to do something in our community, he can give sight to a blind community. I'm, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. 
I'm pressing on. But brothers and sisters, the query becomes what happens when Jesus shows up in a blind community? What happens when Jesus shows up in a blind home? What happens when Jesus shows up in a blind church? What happens when Jesus shows up? I want to pause. Brothers and sisters, take it a little more slowly. It is evident that the first thing that Jesus does is focus on the cause and not the symptoms. Brothers and sisters, we must focus on the cause and not the symptoms. We, we got to focus on not, uh, uh, not that people are not at church, but we got to focus on why folks are not at church. Brothers and sisters, unlike the community, Jesus saw a man born blind. Let, let me rewind and say that, brothers and sisters. Jesus looked at the man. He saw a man born blind. This act not only shows that Jesus focuses on the cause, but furthermore, what blesses me and encourages me is also that Jesus demonstrates that he will never confuse an adjective with a noun. Y'all come on, go with me to grammar school right quick. Jesus saw a man, the noun, and brothers and sisters who was blind. But brothers and sisters, that's an adjective. But the uh, contrary uh, to what the community saw, they saw a blind and a needy man. L let me rewind again, brothers and sisters. They, uh, Jesus saw a man who was blind. But brothers and sisters, the community saw a blind and needy man. Jesus, perhaps, even if he was in our day, Jesus would look and see the person before he would see their malady. He would look and see a child, uh, a child with autism instead of an autistic child. Jesus looks at the person and understands that brothers and sisters, he shows that the symptoms are only temporary situations and not permanent conditions. I want somebody to know that whatever you're going through, brothers and sisters, that your issue is only a temporary situation and not a permanent condition. Your loss of job is just a temporary situation and not a permanent condition. Your depression because you're not where you thought you wanted to be at this point in life is just a temporary situation and not a permanent condition. Brothers and sisters, your breakup is just a temporary uh, condition, uh, situation, not a permanent condition. Understand that Jesus can work in your situation. To put it a little bit differently, the man was not blind because he was a beggar, but he was a beggar because he was blind. Once Jesus cured his blindness, the man was no longer a beggar. Because of God's grace and mercy, Jesus looks beyond our adjectives. Y'all come on and help me preach this thing. Put some emojis, some hands up. God looks beyond our adjectives. Talk to me somebody. God looks beyond our shortcomings. God looks beyond our failures. God looks beyond what we don't do right and what we don't know. God looks beyond our faults and our needs and our problems and he sees them as opportunities for God to reveal both his power and his glory. Talk to me, somebody in here. Brothers and sisters, understand that God sees your problems, your shortcomings, your needs as opportunities for God to operate in power in your situation. Understand this. Not long ago, I posted a story uh, on Facebook and that story says that all of us are broken, but Paul suggests to us that we have 
this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellency of power may be of God and not ourselves. In other words, brothers and sisters, although we are broken, although we have shortcomings, although we have bad habits, God can still operate in us and on us for the purpose of the kingdom of God. I'm pressing on to my close. But as we further examine John 9, I almost want to stand up here. As we examine John 9, we learn a few things about God. Uh, in this particular uh, process of the restoring of sight, the first thing that the text suggests is that God can see you when you cannot see him. God can see you when you can't see. God can see you when you can't see him. I, and somebody is missing their shout right now because God can see you when you can't see him. You brothers and sisters understand that God is looking at your situation even though you don't feel like God is present. God is present even, and that suggests to us brothers and sisters that we've got to be able to trust God even though we can't trace him. God can see us even though we can't see him. Somebody may be saying, well, pastor, uh, please show me that in the text. Let's look at verse one. Jesus saw the blind man when the blind man couldn't see him often in the storms of life. We cannot see God moving and working on our behalf. But thank, thanks be to God God can see us and he can see our struggles. He can see our pains. He can see when we feel incompetent. God can see your struggles and your pains. Do I have any witnesses in here? God can see your struggles and see your pains. Second, the text lets us know that God has a miracle for your specific situation. God has a mirror. I, I want to rewind, brothers and sisters, just a little bit because I, I don't want to skip over the progress that we are making in our Bible study because, brothers and sisters, we see uh, that Job had some issues going on, but the Lord was still present. Understand that, brothers and sisters, God is working behind the scenes uh, while you are sometimes are experiencing the storms of life and some. Sometimes those storms of life seek to strengthen our faith and deepen our resolve. It serves to get help us to get another perspective on life. Brothers and sisters, understand that God is operating even though we can't see him. Again, I want you all to also understand, brothers and sisters, that God has uh, a miracle that meets your particular need. Jesus anointed uh, the eyes of this blind man with a substance composed of saliva and dirt. After the blind man followed Jesus' command to go to wash in the pool of Siloam, uh, his sight had been recovered. Jesus had provided a miracle to meet the man's needs. I, I want the pleasant parishioners to hear this today. And I, I think that we as a body of Christ, we as a church in a hurting community ought to do the same thing that Jesus did. Jesus provided miracles that met the folks needs. Y'all don't believe me. The synoptic gospel uh, is filled with rich examples. You all uh, don't believe me. You all remember when he went to uh, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Jesus turned water into wine. He fulfilled a need. Uh, if, you, if that's not a good enough thing for you, you all remember the woman with the issue of blood. She was healed from her disease. Y'all uh, still not walking with me? Uh, she was healed 
from this disease if she could just touch the hem of his garment. When the apostle Peter needed money for his taxes, Jesus provided a fish with a coin in the fish's mouth. For the woman caught in adultery, he silenced her critics. Our elders or the seasoned saints used to tell us that Jesus is water in dry places. He's bread in a starving land. He's bridge over troubled waters. And might I suggest to you, our millennials might say that he's financial planning in debt. What our millennials might say that he is a COVID testing center in the midst of a pandemic. What our millennials might say, he's a, a, a counseling in the midst of discovering that you have depression. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is whatever we need. God will provide for us whatever we need. Finally, as I... Uh, Rush with rapidity to my conclusion as we consider chapter nine, brothers and sisters. Uh, chapter nine shows that the blind man obeyed Jesus. Church, we've got to obey Jesus. We've got to obey. Uh, we've got to obey uh, the Great Commission. We've got to obey the Lord and understand that we live in an evolving a world. Although God does not change, understand that our approach to ministry must change. I often wonder how brothers and sisters, he made it to the pool in spite of his blindness. Sometimes brothers and sisters, uh, we may not understand what God is doing in our lives, but we've got to do what the Lord says. The blind man, uh, he, 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 I wonder how he made it to the pool despite of his blindness. The blind man, however, just obeyed Jesus without seeing the road ahead. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, that's how faith is. It operates as we walk by faith in God's word. Sometimes things may look different than they perhaps uh, did in the past. But brothers and sisters, understand that God is still walking with us as we walk by faith. He heals us and gives us a progressive revelation of his son as we, and brothers and sisters, as we trust him and we find a testimony of the power of God. The blind man, the blind man's view of Jesus changes from verse 11 uh, to verse 38. It's one thing and then it progresses to another and then it all it progresses yet again. When Jesus comes in your life, your view of Jesus ought to progress from one thing to another. Let's look at it in verse 11. Brothers and sisters, we see. Uh, the blind man first calls Jesus a man. Then in verse 17, he calls Jesus a prophet. And finally, in verse 38, he calls Jesus Lord. He is transformed from a beggar to a witness <laughs> of the power of God after he recognizes Jesus as Lord. When we, brothers and sisters, when asked about his opinion of Jesus, he stated before him, I, before I met him, and they were brothers and sisters, the people gathered around to criticize, they gathered around to criticize, but he said, but listen, I, I don't know about all of that. I don't know about all of that, but this is what the blind man says. One thing I know that before I met him, I was blind. But now I can see him. I can see 
But before I met Jesus, I was blind, but now I see. I'm sure that he can agree with the lyrics of Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Brothers and sisters, the virtual door of God's house is open. The virtual door of the Lord's house is open. The virtual door of the Lord's house is open. We uh, invite you to become a part of the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church uh, in a few ways. You can reach out to a pleasant parishioner uh, and as the pleasant parishioner, as you reach out to the pleasant parishioner, the pleasant parishioner will then reach out to ministers uh, and deacons uh, and, uh, and relay your information to the church. However, I urge you to do th these two things. If you would like to become uh, a part of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, uh, you can call the church office at 314-535-735. Of uh, three one four five three five seven five four eight, and leave us a voicemail uh, on uh, our answering service. Or, brothers and sisters, you can uh, leave. Uh, you can uh, email us at ghpruitt at gmail dot com. Ghpruitt at gmail dot com. And brothers and sisters, you can leave us an email. But whatever platform you leave the message on, whether it is a voicemail on our church office or an email uh, on our church uh, email system, we will respond to you expeditiously and as soon as possible. Brothers and sisters, we are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful for you. Uh, we are thankful for you coming to share with us on this day. On this day, brothers and sisters, also, we want to offer you uh, just we want to be thankful. We're thankful for all of you who continue to give. We're thankful for all of you who continue to give again. Uh, we know that the word of God says honor God with your wealth. Um, and we are thankful for your generosity. And I want to share with you ways that you can continue uh, being generous to uh, the ministry of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. Brothers and sisters, you can uh, send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. You can send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church uh, at 1220, 1220 REV GH Pruitt Place, 1220 REV GH Pruitt Place, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. There, brothers and sisters, uh, you can send a check or a money order. Or, brothers and sisters, feel free uh, to give to us digitally. You can uh, log on to our website at www.pgmbcstl.org. Uh, and, brothers and sisters, you can find our giving tab. Click on our giving tab, and there you can give digitally. You can give digitally. Brothers and sisters, we are thankful. Uh, we are thankful for your presence and your participation online. If you've gotten something out of this service, come on, put a heart up, put a like up, uh, uh, give, give us an emoji. Let us know uh, that uh, the ministry of Pleasant Green has been blessing you through the proclamation of the word of God. Amen. Amen. It is the first Sunday. It is the first Sunday. It is the first Sunday. We want to pause for a moment of prayer as we um, get ready to engage in the Lord's Supper. Brothers and sisters, we do this. We don't do this. This is not what saves us, but we do this because we are saved. This is a commandment. We want to pause for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for allowing us to um, have another chance to uh, get right what we got wrong on yesterday. God, we pray now that um, uh, that we have a spirit of repentance. Lord God, that we, you, we ask that you take out uh, those things that are impure and improper uh, as we engage in 
this Lord's Supper. And Lord God, as you take those things out, after we engage in this supper, Lord God, we ask that we have the spirit not to pick it back up after we engage in the Lord's Supper. Lord God, let us uh, take the Lord's Supper uh, worthily. Lord God, we are not worthy, but allow us to take this Lord's Supper worthily. And Lord God, and we do that by the repentance uh, of our sins. Have mercy upon us today. And Lord God, let us remember that this is because of your broken body and your shedding of blood. And for that, we are thankful. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank God. Amen. 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 If you have your bread, if you have your wafer, if you have your cracker, uh, if you have your, your juice or your wine or your Kool-Aid, God knows the difference. But it is the fact uh, that you're doing this in remembrance of God. Brother, brothers and sisters, uh, we don't we don't believe in transubstantiation, uh, meaning that this is the actual uh, blood of Jesus and the actual body of of Jesus, but we believe that this is a representation of his broken body and his shed blood. Brothers and sisters, if you would allow me uh, to read Mark, the 22nd, in the 22nd chapter, Mark, the 22nd chapter. Excuse me, Luke, excuse me, Luke, excuse me, Luke, the 22nd chapter. Pastor Letcher almost needed to be in, in Sunday school with that one. Luke, the 22nd chapter. <laughs> and then you will find these words. The 19th verse reads as follows. It says, and he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. This is do in due of remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But look at the hand of the one betraying me. It is at hand. For the Son of Man will go away, and it has been determined. But woe to that man whom it has betrayed. Brothers and sisters, let us consider the bread. We give thanks unto God. And the wine or the juice. Let us commune together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, Brothers and sisters, you may consider yourselves dismissed. I pray that you have been inspired, encouraged, and evoked into living a life that is worthy and pleasing in the sight of God. Until we meet again, may God bless you.